Martineau is best known for her journalistic contributions on a vast number of controversial issues that agitated the early and mid-Victorian period. Her many radical stances on issues such as education, women's rights, or the abolition of slavery reflect the evolution of her ideas from her early career as a contributor to the Unitarian magazine The Monthly Repository to her late philosophical inquiry into the progress of the world and man's individual and social responsibilities. Far from denying that the universe was ruled by a first cause, she moved away from her Christian faith to the belief of the universe being ruled by the universal laws of nature, which only science could attain. This philosophical position was highlighted by her joint publication with Henry Atkinson of Letters on the Laws of Man's Nature and Development in 1851, as well as her translation and condensation of Auguste Comte's Positive Philosophy in 1853. Her belief in the world being the result of evolution and not of divine creation was the source of her lifelong intellectual commitment. Martineau was born in 1802 in England and was the sixth of eight children. Her family was more economically stable and wealthier than most British families at the time, and her father owned a textile mill and her mother was the daughter of a sugar refiner and a grocer. Her family practiced Unitarianism, which influenced her social theory and her beliefs about social justice. Unitarians typically believed in the inherent worth of every human being, justice, equity, and compassion among all human beings, and a free search for truth and meaning among other things. We can see how this primed her from an early age for her work in social justice and equality. Martineau began writing in 1829 when her father's business failed. She was one of the first women journalists of the era and also worked as a translator, speechwriter, and a novelist. And her work sold more than Dickens at the time. Embracing writing as a career was a bold step for any woman in those days, but she was sustained by a firm belief in her duty, a recurring word in her discourse. Early in her career, she advocated for free market or laissez-faire economic principles in line with the philosophy of Adam Smith. But later in her career, she switched positions to advocate for government's responsibility to stem inequality and injustice, and is remembered by some as a social reformer due to her belief in the progressive evolution of society. Martineau's belief in social progress is similar to that of Auguste Comte, one of the early philosophers of science whose ideas helped shape the emergence of a science of society. Comte founded the concept of positivism, which at its core emphasizes the verification of natural phenomena by observation. It emphasized the gathering of empirical evidence. In other words, verified data gathered through observation. Positivism gained significant popularity during the 19th century, but during the 20th century, scholars such as Max Weber criticized positivism for accepting as true knowledge only that which is clear, something that Weber and other anti-positivists saw as a blatant rejection of much of the social world, which was in fact not clear. Anti-positivists also argue that positivism focused too much on generalization of data, which obscured the nuance of human social life. Today, critics of positivism tend to point out the flaws in the idea of a true knowledge, as this has historically rejected any knowledge that is not based on Western male-centric knowledge. Scholars in the tradition of Black feminist thought will later critique positivism as wrongly dividing science and home life, arguing that knowledge acquired through daily activities, particularly those of women in the home and in their communities, is just as valid as the knowledge acquired through positivist approaches. Martineau's social theory had four key themes. First, the subject matter of sociology is a society's configuration of morals and manners. Morals and manners might be best equated to our concept of culture today. By morals, Martineau meant society's belief about behavior, and by manners, she was referring to the actual patterns of social action in that society. So morals were the beliefs about behavior, and manners were the behaviors themselves. When Martineau said that manners are inseparable from morals because they cease to have meaning when separated, she's emphasizing the importance of meaning that individuals attribute to their actions. This will later be emphasized by Max Weber and his concept of Versten. So Martineau saw individuals as the link between a society's morals and manners. However, she didn't believe that individuals were passively reproducing a society's morals. Instead, she believed that individuals both replicated and challenged a society's morals. So she sought to both generalize about those morals that were fixed through individuals' manners, 
as well as identify any anomalies. Second, the validity of sociological knowledge depends on the interconnectedness of impartiality, critique, and sympathy. By impartiality, Martineau did not believe in value neutrality, which we'll discuss later in the semester. Instead, she meant the ability to reject ethnocentrism, or the evaluation of cultures different from one's own by the standards set forth in one's own culture. So Martineau was careful to develop a standard of evaluation that could be applied to all societies, regardless of their differences in morals and manners. This was done by comparing the principles that a society sets for itself with the actual reality of that society. The textbook uses an example of the Declaration of Independence, which Martineau identified as laying out certain principles for equality. But then in American society, there was significant inequality, which countered the values set forth in this founding document. So Martineau used a society's own standards and principles to identify whether or not those were actually manifested in the society. Another standard of judgment was the relative amount of human happiness, which Martineau believed was a universal principle. She focused on the amount of domination that was present in a society, arguing that domination violates the ability for human happiness to exist. This relates to the importance of sympathy to Martineau, which she believed was essential for the student of society. She rejected the idea of a sociologist who studied society impartially without using this knowledge to advocate for greater equality and justice. Third, Martineau sought representations of morals and manners in the society being studied. In other words, Martineau believed in the study of things using a methodology of people's explanations about those things to figure out how they were thought of in a society. Today, we would consider this to be qualitative methodology by interviewing participants rather than seeking large-scale survey data. However, Martineau also believed in generalizations. To do this, she argued that you needed to choose the appropriate topic to study. These topics would be things that are universal features of social life such as burial arrangements, which could be studied across cultures. Finally, to Martineau, sociology is a critical science that has an ethical duty to oppose domination. This is a key feature of her social theory, as many in the positivist trend rejected the belief that social science should seek to make ethical judgments of how society should be rather than how it is. Martineau identified three ways that domination could be observed in a society. First, the condition of the less powerful. Second, the society's idea of liberty. And third, the society's progress in providing all people with the means to develop one's own judgments and beliefs. Martineau was especially critical of American society, which she observed in a two-year trip abroad. She saw that America was wealthy enough to provide for its most disenfranchised members of society, yet America's overvaluing of wealth prevented this. Martineau believed that once Americans saw the cost of fetishizing wealth, such as crime, anxiety, and ill health, they would achieve an equalization of property. In other words, redistribution of wealth and private property, which at that time was the greatest indicator of wealth. When we discuss Marx, we'll see how his vision of revolution is similar and different from Martineau's. When she returned from America, she published Society in America in 1837, and this book was mainly a critique of America's attempt to live up to its democratic principles. Martineau was especially concerned about the treatment of women and called one chapter the political non-existence of women. She claimed that women were given indulgence rather than justice, and she argued for an improvement in women's education so that marriage need not be their only object in life. Of Martineau's numerous works, society in America is the most widely known to sociologists in the United States. She documented a wide chasm between extant institutional patterns and the values of democracy, justice, equality, and freedom that Americans claim to cherish. Beyond society in America, Martineau's other economic, political, and historical studies remain largely unsighted by sociologists. Her systematic observations of society are directly relevant to historical and comparative sociologists who would unravel the complexities of Victorian England and 19th century life generally. In How to Observe Morals and Manners, Martineau provided the first known systematic methodological treatise in sociology. Confronting the problem of studying a society as a whole, she creatively attacked problems of bias, generalization, samples, reactivity, interviews, corroboration, and data recording techniques. 
she outlined studies of the major social institutions, including religion, education, family, arts and popular culture, markets and economy, prisons, government, and philanthropy. How to Observe also is a precedent-setting work of theory. Before Karl Marx and decades before Emile Durkheim and Max Weber, Martineau sociologically examined social class, forms of religion, types of suicide, national character, domestic relations, and the status of women, delinquency and criminology, and the intricate interrelations between repressive social institutions and the individual.